Welcome to the Sunday School Hour. If you would, in your Bibles, please turn to James chapter 5. James chapter 5, as you find your seat. And allow me to go ahead and open up in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning asking for your help. Lord, I ask that out of the Scriptures today you would teach us about the power of prayer. Lord, we love you, and there's many of us that need answers to prayer right now. And I just ask that you would use these Scriptures to empower us to get closer to you, to walk with you, so we can have victory through you. Lord, I ask that you would fill us with the Holy Spirit this morning and help us to honor you in all that we do. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. James chapter 5, once you're there, let's start in verse number 13. James 5, verse 13. Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Is any merry? Let him sing psalms. He starts off by saying, are you afflicted? Well, the, the solution is to pray. Did you think to pray as the song goes, right? Verse 14, is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him anointing Him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick. I want you to focus on that. The prayer of faith shall save the sick. God's trying to teach us that our petition to Him for healing, it's all right there. It comes from the prayer of faith. He says, the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up, and if he, hath, if he hath committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Confess your faults one to another, and pray for one another that ye may be healed. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Verse 17 and 18 are very unique. Look what it says. Elias was a man subject to like passions as we are, and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. Elisha, I'm sorry, Elijah in the Old Testament prayed to God and he was able to bend the will of God and, uh, and God answered by stopping the, prayer, the rain in a region for three and a half years. Verse 18, and he prayed again and the heaven gave rain and the earth brought forth her fruit. We live in a time where Christians really are, we're, we're denuded in our growth. We're retarded in our spiritual growth. We're not moving forward. We don't believe in the power of prayer anymore. And I want to make sure that you understand that we, we believe in a living God. We call on a Lord that knows our heart. He knows our life. He knows our intentions. And He actually has a desire to help us and to heal us and to see us trust in Him. There is such great power in prayer that so many Christians just leave as if it doesn't exist. I want to encourage you this morning through several scriptures how awesome it is when you can call on the name of the Lord with a need and watch God provide for you. If you would, go to Matthew chapter 6. Let's go to Matthew chapter 6. When you get there, let's look at verse number 5. Matthew 6, 5, the Bible reads, And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites. Now, two things here right away. When thou prayest is not saying, if you get around to praying. He's kind of saying it as a commandment. He's saying, hey, you need to pray. When you pray. Brother Paul, if, you're, if you need that fan, it's the lower two switches right around the corner from you behind that door. Yes, sir. So he says, When thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites, for they love to pray, standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the street, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. Any act of service, any spiritual work that you do, when you do it with the intention of just being seen by men, hey, look at my name, look at my power, look at my humility, right? 
what's the old joke? I wrote a book. It's called The 12 Most Humble People in the World and How I Met the Other 11. Right? You would say, well, you're not one of the humble ones if you're writing a book calling yourself the most humble person in the world. Right? Uh, but think about it. Anything you do with a selfish reason to show off for yourself and steal glory for God, you're, you have your reward in that you are seen by men. The hypocrites... The Pharisees, the false prophets, they would stand in public and they would make this big long prayer with big old $10 words just so people would be impressed by, wow, that guy really knows how to pray. But he was not praying to the Lord. He was just praying to be seen of men and that was his reward. Everybody saw him. God comes to us in the still small voice and God tells us to pray in our closet. I think many times when you pray in your heart when no one hears it, there's a strong connection between the Lord. You're coming out of humility. Like the man that beat upon his breast as he was saying, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. Instead of being the hypocrite that stood in public to show off, he was saying, Lord, be merciful to me. Now, we pray publicly in the church. This is a biblical concept. This is not the same thing. We are asking some of the men here to ask God uh, to send His Spirit, uh, to help us put us in the right mindset, to help us to worship Him, to magnify His Word, uh, to help reduce distractions. We ask for God's Spirit so that we can pray through the Spirit for the power in our congregation in the local church every time we gather. Uh, we don't just go through it to check a box. Yep, we pray. No, there's great thought and intention in it. It is a very important portion. There are many times in the Bible where public prayer was necessary. The warning here was at the temple where people would come and give their offering, and you would have the one standing up, Oh, Lord, I'm not like them. And you had the guy down there saying, Oh, God, help me. Oh, Lord, I need your help and your forgiveness and your mercy. And that's a prayer that God hears. When you pray to be seen of men, well, you have your reward. You're seen of men, right? Notice in verse 6 at the end here, he tells us as Christians, he says, pray to thy Father which is in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. This is the key to prayer. If your prayer life is to bow your head at the table and just mumble the same prayer you've always said since you was a kid over some food, you're really missing out as a Christian. Your prayer is non-stop, secret, in your heart, in your mind, to God. Your Creator made your eyeball. He knows what you're looking at. He made your mind. He knows what you're meditating on. He made your heart. He, know what, he knows what your emotions and your spirit and your intentions are. And He wants you to constantly communicate with Him. And the more that you pray in secret, the more that your Father will reward you openly. If you have no secret prayer life, then you may not get public blessings from the Lord. Look at verse 7. But when we pray, use not vain repetitions. Now, vain is hollow or puffed up. It's pointless or worthless. Repetitions is saying the same thing over and over. The Catholics are famously known for this. They pray, they pray the same prayer every time. They don't even know what the words mean. Some of them literally don't even know the words. They're just mumbling sounds that they've put together. And if they read the words, they would be surprised at what they're actually saying because they're just mumbling sounds. He says, when you pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Be not ye therefore like unto them, for your Father knoweth what things ye have need of before ye ask Him. He knows what you need. Sometimes He's just waning on us to ask. Verse 9, after this manner, therefore, pray ye. So He said, here's the pattern, here's what you do. Our Father, which art in heaven. So, first of all, we're addressing God. We come to Him and acknowledge who He is, where He is, what power He has. He is our Creator. He's everything. He says, hallowed be Thy name. When we say, oh God, You are holy, You are great, You are wonderful, we're kind of lowering ourselves and humbling ourselves as we're acknowledging that He has all the power and that His name is greater than our name. He says, thy kingdom come. Now here we're saying, God, I want you to win. 
The things that you want to happen, I want that to happen in my life. Now we add to the kingdom when we preach the gospel and somebody gets saved. One day he's literally going to bring a kingdom to this earth and, and there's an eternal kingdom that's on its way as well. And we're saying, instead of my little kingdom that I have with what little power and influence I have, forget about that. No, no. God, use me to bring in your great, holy, eternal kingdom. He says, thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Here's the funny thing. When we get to heaven, we're not going to be selfish anymore. We're not going to have our own agenda. We're not going to have our own priorities. We're not going to waste time. No, no, we're going to serve the Lord. We'll see Him for who He is. We'll be glorified as Jesus is. We'll be in an eternal state. And then we'll recognize that the will of the Father is that we would serve Him in heaven. So what ought it to be on the earth? We'll to serve Him now as well. Thy will be done here. Help me choose to do it here, now, while I'm here, before I get there. He says in verse 11, give us this day our daily bread. Now this is interesting. Don't our prayers typically start with, gimme, gimme, gimme. Notice his order. Jesus said, listen, you want God's attention. Here's what you do. You magnify him. You acknowledge him. You honor him. You tell him, I'm working on your kingdom. You tell him whatever you want, not what I want. Sometimes we come and we say, oh God, I need this. And then we say, well, if it's your will. Notice the other way around. Say, Lord, whatever your will is, that's what I want. And I'm here to ask for something specific. And if it's your will, that's what I want. If it'll build your kingdom, then that's what I want, Lord. Help bend my will to your will. Give us this day our daily bread. There's nothing wrong for ad asking for daily provision, but let's make sure we do it in proper order. Verse 12, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Now, he's talking about our offenses to our brothers and sisters in Christ. That's a, a major aspect of this verse. And, and here's the question, when you bring your gift to the altar, have you already reconciled to your brother? Are you begrudging them in your heart? Are you still mad at them? Do you talk bad about them behind their back? If they were standing in your face, would you talk about them the way that you do when you're all alone with your family? Because if, if you're a hypocrite in that area, then you need to make it right with your brother or sister in Christ, and you need to reconcile that, that situation, and you need to ask them to forgive you for doing wrong. Otherwise, when you come to God, He's going to say, well, I want to forgive you, but I'm waiting on you to get forgiveness from your brother first. Sometimes we let our relationships stand in the way of getting answered prayer. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Verse 13, and lead us not into temptation. Guys, this is a prayer that we all have to pray. God, help me to not sin. Lord, help me to not sin with my mouth or my ears or my eyes or my hands or my feet. Help me to not sin with my heart. Lead us not into temptation. God, keep me away from temptation. He says, but deliver us from evil. Keep us from the harm, especially the harm that's self-inflicted by a life of sin. The next portion is actually deleted from the majority of the new Bibles out there. It says, for thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. I'm coming to God with a prayer. I need an answer. He's the only one that has the power to give me the answer, and I'm acknowledging who He is. And, and then I'm sandwiching it with my request, and at the end I'm acknowledging who it is that has the power to answer this prayer and to grant my petition. Verse 14, look what Jesus says, For if ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Moreover, when ye fast. Now, he does the same thing here. He says, when you pray. He's assuming, hey, you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you're going to call upon the name of the Lord. And when you call on Him for daily provision or help or strength or growth or biblical understanding, you're getting closer to Him. And he says, when you pray. But then he says, when you fast. Did you know God wants you to fast? Did you know that's an expectation of the Christian life? If you haven't lately, I just go ahead and pull out the calendar and say, for whatever reason, I'm going to pick this Friday. Mark it. I'm not eating. I'm going to fast. I'm going to get close to the Lord. I'm going to focus on prayer and fasting that day and studying the Scriptures. He says, when ye fast, in verse 16, be not as the hypocrites. Hey, even the hypocrites fast. This isn't just fasting for a diet. Hey, you know, fasting is good for your health, right? But I'm talking about spiritually, fasting is good for your humility. 
Be not as the hypocrites of a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces that they may appear unto men to fast. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. What's he talking about? Somebody comes by at work. Oh, hey, did you want a cookie? Oh, brother, I'm fasting today. I'm being spiritual. Oh, it's miserable. I can barely make it. Wow, how long has it been? Two and a half hours. You know? <laughs> wow. <laughs> The hypocrites want to be seen of men. They want to be known as holy, right? Well, you know what? The most holy people you know, uh, they're not wearing it on their sleeve. It's inside. It's in their heart. They're praying in secret. They're fasting in secret. Uh, they're, they're trying to just mark out some territory in this wicked flesh for the Lord. And they're saying, Lord, I've got some stuff I need to get out, and I need your help to get in, and I want to work on me. I want to fix this old flesh. He says, verse 17, but thou, when thou fastest, again, he says it, anoint thy head and wash thy face. Do you know why he says that? Now, back then, uh, what's a little bit different? It's like, oh, wow, you didn't shower today. Well, I'm fasting, brother. Can't you see? You know, <laughs> oh, you're on the job site in sackcloth and ashes. Where's your boots at, buddy? We got to go to work. You know what I mean? <laughs> we're not trying to show off that we're fasting and show off that we're praying. No, no. We want to keep that secret because it's with God. It's, it's God's attention we desire, not the attention of people. He says in verse 18, that thou appear not unto men to fast, but unto thy father, which is in secret, and thy father, which seeth in secret, shall reward thee openly. Go to Matthew 17. Go ahead to Matthew chapter 17. We're talking about fasting and prayer this morning, and I want to be brief on these next two points. I want to go back to James 5 where we started because that is the meat of the message for Sunday school. Uh, the Bible says that we can come together as a group and ask the Lord for help, and He will give it to us. Here in a moment after the message, I'm going to stop for a moment, and I'm going to open it up to silent prayer. And in your heart, if there's something you're working on, now's the time to do it. And then we're going to pray for each other. And if there's something you say, well, I came and I wasn't prepared. I didn't fast yesterday, but I'm here today. And I believe this, that I can call on God and He can help me. And I have a health issue and I need help. Uh, maybe I can come down and pray. I would say, amen. Come on down and we'll pray over you. I want you to see Matthew 17. This is important. Look at verse number 14. And when they were come... To the multitude there came him a certain man kneeling down to him and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is lunatic. My dad used to send me that as a daily motivation. He was, he was such an encourager. Uh, this guy's got a problem. His son is loony. That's where we get the word. It comes from the moon. They would stare at the moon at night. They're up all night instead of during the day. This was somebody that was possessed, right? He says, I have mercy on my son, for he is a lunatic and sore vexed. In other words, he's super troubled in the spirit. For oft times he falleth in the fire, and oft times into the water. Okay, he's like clumsy. He's hurting himself. It's more than just clumsy. It's like there's a devil in him trying to make him hurt himself. He says in verse 16, And I brought him to thy disciples, and they could not cure him. Then Jesus answered and said, O faithless and perverse generation. This is Jesus rebuking the disciples that weren't ready, not the man that brought his son. How long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him hither to me. And Jesus rebuked the devil. Notice that Jesus rebuked the devil. Now I got to tell you, uh, I've seen Pentecostals and they go around swinging their jacket and say, I'm rebuking the devil. Notice who here rebukes the devil? Jesus has the power to rebuke a devil in your life. Jesus has the power to rebuke sickness, mental disease, Spiritual affliction, physical, I mean physical problems, physical ailments. Jesus has all power both in heaven and in earth. And most of the time we don't have enough faith to bring it to him and say, Jesus, will you rebuke this devil? Look what he says. 18, and Jesus rebuked the devil and he departed out of him. And the child was cured from that very hour. Then came the disciples to Jesus apart and said, Why could not we cast him out? And Jesus said unto him, Because of your unbelief. Lord, why can't I move mountains? Because you don't believe that I'll move that mountain for you. I was talking to another preacher yesterday. We, as Law of Liberty, have been praying for some time for 
a larger facility. We're running out of room. And my family's been praying for a larger house. We're running out of room. And, you know, it's like, yeah, we're praying for a mountain that doesn't exist. And I was talking to this guy yesterday about this hill over here used to be the tallest point in Duval County. Did you guys know that? This land right next to us, there's a little, there's a marker from the 50s where they scoped it out. And this was the highest point in Duval. And it's like, wow, God gave us a mountain. How cool is that? God is good. <laughs> Why don't we get what we need? Because you don't believe He'll give it to you. It's not about believing you deserve it. Some of us are too hard on ourselves. We let the devil whisper in our ear and the devil says, oh, you don't deserve healing. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I don't deserve it. I don't deserve these blessings. This is a gift from God. Because of your unbelief, I believe that sometimes God will give us great things that we don't deserve, that we haven't earned. He loves to give gifts unto us, doesn't He? He says in verse 20, And Jesus said unto them, Because of your unbelief, for verily I say unto you, if ye have faith as a grain of a mustard seed, super small seed that turns into a massive tree, right? He says, you have faith as a grain of a mustard seed. You shall say unto this mountain, remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove. Nothing shall be impossible unto you. How be it? This kind goeth not out, but by prayer and fasting. How be it? Notice this verse is deleted from all the modern Bibles. Every one of them deletes this verse. Why? Because they want to take the power out of your prayer. He says, but wait, there's this one thing. Don't you run through your week being selfish and greedy and mean to others and unforgiving and not searching for God. And then all of a sudden it's like, oh, wait, hey, I need something. Hey, God, I need something. You give it to me. No. He says, you pray and you fast. You afflict your flesh. You separate yourself from worldliness. You get alone with God and you cry out to the Lord and you ask Him for help. You pray in secret. You pray in secret. You consistently pray and fast in secret if you really want an answer to your prayer. Uh, if you would, go to Mark 9 real quick. This is the parallel. Mark chapter 9. And we're looking for verse 22 when you get there. Mark 9, 22. This is a parallel, it's the same story, a continuation with a little bit more details from Mark. Verse 22, And oft times it hath cast him in the fire and in the waters to destroy him. But if thou canst do anything, have compassion on us and help us. He says, God, uh, my son, has a, he's, a, he's got a devil, he's a lunatic, he's got these problems, he's throwing him in the fire. If you can do anything, have compassion on us, love us and be merciful to us. Look at verse 23, And Jesus said to him, If thou Hence believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. This verse is so good. I tell you, last night I printed this out and I taped it to my wall in my office. This is such a great verse. If you can believe, all things are possible to him that can believe. Do you believe that? Do you believe that your faith in what God can do? I believe in a big God that can answer big prayers. I do. And yet it's still up to him. And it's still up to us. If thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. And straightway, that means immediately, the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe. Help thou mine unbelief. What a statement. Oh God, of course I believe you, but I'm struggling with doubt. Help me to get rid of this unbelief. Unbelief is why the, the disciples couldn't cast out the devil. They bring him to him and he says, Lord, I do believe you can. That's why I'm here and I'm asking you. And yet I still have these doubts. Help me to eliminate my doubt. Now that's a great prayer. When you come to God with a big need and you've got a big prayer and you're looking for a big miracle, you better start with those little prayers day in and day out of God. Please eliminate my doubt. Because if I'm doubting anything, who am I doubting? You? That's not right. Oh, I can doubt myself, and I can doubt this flesh, and I can doubt this building, and I can doubt this world. But if you doubt God, why would He answer that prayer? Lord, I believe. Help thou mine unbelief. What a fantastic prayer. Every Christian can say, God, I do believe, and I struggle. Help me to believe more. You know, to His disciples, He said, add to your faith. 
They said, Lord, the disciples came and he said, increase our faith. Hey, we're saved by faith, but now he says walk by faith, which means day in and day out, you've got to trust him more and more for everything. He says in verse 25, when Jesus saw that the people came running together, he rebuked the foul spirit. You remember, it called it a devil. Here he says, it's unclean, it's foul, it's filthy. You know what the world wants to do with you? You know what the devil wants to do with your body? He wants to get in your mind and get you to do the filthy stuff the world's doing. That's a foul spirit. Get it out of you. When Jesus saw that the people came running together, he rebuked the foul spirit, saying unto him, Thou dumb and deaf spirit, I charge thee, come out of him and enter no more into him. I love how Jesus put some boundaries and he says, And don't come back. And he had that power, didn't he? Verse 26, And the Spirit cried, and rent him sore, and came out of him. And he was as one dead, insomuch he said, He is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand, and lifted him up, and he arose. And when he was come into the house, the disciples asked him privately, Why could not we cast him out? And he said to them, This kind can come forth by nothing but by prayer and fasting. Go back to James, if you would. This time go to James chapter 1 real quick. We're going to stop there, and then move back to James 5, and we'll be done. James chapter 1. In Matthew 21, Jesus said, In all things whatsoever ye shall ask in prayer, believing ye shall receive. All things whatsoever ye shall ask in prayer, believing ye shall receive. Do you believe that? Is that a promise you want to take hold of? James chapter 1, real quick, look at verse 6 and 7 with me. But let him ask in faith, Nothing wavering, for he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think he shall receive anything of the Lord. Hey, don't be tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. No, you have faith that he can answer. And, and then you just say, Lord, if it's your will, answer this prayer. I know that you can. Go to James chapter 5. The question is, are you suffering from unbelief or are you asking in faith? He says that the prayer of faith. James chapter 5, if you would look at verse number 13. Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Is any merry? Let him sing psalms. It's interesting, he gives us the spectrum. Lord, I'm hurting and down, he says, then pray. Lord, I'm happy and up, he says, then sing to the Lord, right? Praise the Lord. Verse 14, is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil. You say, is the oil magical? No, sir, not at all. Can I use any old oil off the shelf? Well, I guess you could. I just wouldn't recommend canola. That stuff's not really good, right? <laughs> there was an anointing oil. There was a couple different anointing oils in the Bible in the Old Testament. God gave for a pattern, and the ingredients were important. It's not the oil. It's the prayer of faith to a God that answers prayer. But He tells us to do it anyway. So why do we use oil? Well, because we want to obey every word of God. I believe every word of God, so I want to obey what He says. He says, call the elders, pray, and anoint with oil. Now, the oil is the picture of the Holy Spirit. If you remember, as we were going through Samuel, where Samuel anointed David with oil, and it says the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward, and he was another man. He had another heart. There's power in the Holy Spirit anointing, and that's what it symbolizes. In Matthew 6, they tell us, and they cast out many devils and anointed men with oil many that were sick and healed them. This is a pattern that Jesus used. He had His disciples doing the same thing, was using oil. Now look at verse 15. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick. What did Jesus say? According to your faith, be it unto you. How big is your faith? I believe He can answer. Do you? It's up to you. You remember Naaman, he was the captain of the hosts, the king of Syria, right? And he came to Elisha, and he, what did he tell him? Uh, Eli Elisha said, well, you know, go wash in, in the Jordan River. <laughs> the filthy Jordan? We've got better rivers back there. He says, oh, oh, oh. If he had asked you some great thing, wouldn't he have done it? Yeah. Go over here and get this, and run over there and do that, and jump up on a mountain, and come down over here. Okay, I'll do whatever it takes to get an answer from God. And he says, but he asked you a little thing? Just wash in the water seven times? Okay, I believe that. That makes sense. I'll, I'll do the little thing. We'll anoint with oil. We'll ask the men to lay their hands, and we'll pray. 
Because that's what God said. Look at the next part of that verse in verse 15. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick and the Lord shall raise him up. There's the power. God gets all the glory. We are blessed to have a loving, caring, listening God that wants to heal us. And yet we have to remember, I saw a survey. They said that 10 out of 10 people die. Did you guys know that? You're not eternal here. <laughs> You're going to die one day. And when you're on your deathbed, God probably won't answer that prayer for healing. He'll look down compassionately and smile and say, not this time, son. Not this time, daughter. You're coming home. So we just have to be patient. The power is in God. The last of that verse, he says, and if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Sometimes we are afflicted in our finances and our flesh because of our own foolish sins. Plain and simple. And yet, but not always. Sometimes we suffer for our own sins. Sometimes we just suffer for the glory of God. So that God can use our situation so we can help somebody else. John 9, Jesus answered, Neither hath this man sinned nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. Why am I sick? Maybe God wants you to have a testimony to somebody else that He healed you. Why did I have to go through this horrible time in my life? Everybody turned against me. Maybe you, maybe you need to get closer to God and farther away from everybody else. God uses disaster. It's a tool of discipleship. Verse 16, look, He says, Confess your faults one to another. Now, the Catholics will take this out of context and they say, go in a little black room with a guy wearing a dress that's never been married and tell him all your filthy sins. That's not what this is saying. That's not what this is saying at all. You know, confess your faults one to another, especially in this type of situation. It can be, listen, brother, I've really just been struggling with it. Man, I am struggling with my daily reading. And I, would you please pray for me that I can get back on fire for God? I've been distracted by the cares of the world. I've been distracted by my family. I'm doing good at work, but I'm doing horrible in my Bible reading. I'm confessing my fault. Can you pray for me for that? Confessing your faults is not a big public thing. All right, everybody, come up here and tell me all your sins. No, 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 no. It's about, really, when you confess it to a friend, you're looking for accountability to God. I want to get closer to God. He says, confess your faults one to another. So he's talking about dealing with your problems. Sometimes we won't even acknowledge that we have a problem. It's like the guy that keeps filling up his tire, and it's so bald that, I mean, he should have changed it 10,000 miles ago. Acknowledge the problem and fix the tire. Just replace the whole tire, you know? Quit putting patches on it. <laughs> fix your problems. Have love and humility with it. Uh, repair your offenses with your brother and sister. Look what he says, verse 16, and pray for one another. Pray for one another. It's interesting that as, let's say, I'm looking for help. I need God to answer my prayer. Uh, there's these series of steps I go through. I'm going to fast. I'm going to pray. I'm going to put the elders on notice. I need you to come and pray for me. Would you fast too? I need God's help. I need everybody's help. And by the way, I'm struggling with this. Here's my problem and here's my weakness. Maybe, maybe I don't let things go. Maybe I keep bringing back the past. Maybe I'm giving the devil a foothold in my life just saying, well, he got me there and I did this back there. Maybe you need to let that go and just understand that Christ paid for all those sins. Once you then move forward, he says, and pray for one another. You know what helps you to be more spiritual? Pray for somebody else. If you get tired of bringing that same prayer to God, then why don't you bring a new one and pray for somebody else's needs and bring that to God and intercede on their behalf. Care for the brethren. Pray for one another. Petition for God's glory in someone else's life. He says finally there in, that, in verse 16, he says, that ye may be healed, that ye may be healed. You know, sometimes our healing comes after we've confessed our errors and we've prayed for others and we begin to reconcile. Again, now look at the tail end of this. He says, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. A couple big words in there. Effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man. Effectual, that means effective, successful if you will. The successful prayer of a fervent, fervent. You know what fervent is? That word is fire. When you pray to God, do you get fired up and call unto Him? I mean, do you really get excited as you talk to God, or you just kind of mealy mouth mumble over your cereal? No, oh no, hey, I'm going to get excited when you call unto God. He hears every word. He knows what you need, and He wants you to get fired up about your prayer. I mean, if you have, He's like, man, I live in a house full of people. Then go out in the woods. 
Take a walk down the block. Do whatever you have to do to get alone with the Lord and get some fire about your prayer. Be passionate about it. Be sincere when you talk to Him about what you need and where you lack and how you want to help and what you're willing to do and what you need Him to do. I mean, just pour it all out to the Lord. Just give it all to Him. Effectual, fervent. He's saying successful, passionate prayer of a righteous man. Righteous. Now look, there's two different types of righteousness. There is faith righteousness, which saves your soul. I believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. Now I am righteous in my soul, right? But then there's my works righteousness. Now that I'm saved, when I obey Him, I can be righteous and get His blessing in my life. So the saved person living for Him, that's who it's talking about. Get saved. Get on fire for God. Do what He said. And when you have a great big need, He's giving you a, a kind of a checklist the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. That means it'll come out on top. It'll win. In Mark 9, Jesus said, If thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. I believe that. I'm claiming that promise. I'd like to close in prayer and give a moment of silence for those that are in here. If you have something on your heart, that you need to talk to the Lord. Do it in secret. And then I'm going to call for the elders to come down. And if you have a sickness and you want us to lay our hands on you, you can ask the Lord to heal you and anoint you with oil. And then come on down. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I love you. Oh Lord, I know that this is true. Lord, there are people here today that we have practiced this process with as they called for help and we anointed with oil and they received healing. And Lord, we humbly come to you again. We're asking again that you would help us this morning to get close to you. Lord, I ask that you would fill us with your Holy Spirit. Lord, I thank you for those that believe in the power of prayer. I thank you for those that have been fasting in anticipation of helping someone else. Lord, we're going to pray in secret, and I ask that you would reward openly. We ask this in Jesus' name.